Glad to have you all here this morning. Good morning. Sitting in the back, waiting for the choir to come out of the nursery after the rehearsal before service. And Helen walks through and says, there's no choir in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no choir today. Oh, no, they're walking up this time. Yeah. We're walking up. <laughs> you know how you know you love somebody? I love Audrey Arthur, or she would be strangled. <laughs> there's, there's exactly one Audrey Arthur on this planet. Thank God. And there, we could only stand one. But, what did she do? It's an ongoing, it's, shall we compare it to a dripping faucet? <laughs> Ladies, if you go to the bathroom, yes. and you try to want some hot water, Yes. The way you're used to turning the handle was backwards. Now I've turned it so that it goes clockwise, like the cold one. Now it turns right. So you'll get hot water that way. Now, calm down. Just to keep everybody happy, during the week I'm going to change it again so that it turns wrong, clockwise again, which is what you're used to. Okay? Now that that's taken care of, then uh, the dripping faucet in the men's room, I'll take care of that, although when we go in there, it doesn't drip. <coughs> but, Audrey said it dripped. <laughs> All right, let's see what we have here today. On a better note, that's a good note. That doesn't mean anything, I'm just kidding. Uh, April 1st, there's a Easter egg hunt at Callahan Park over here in German. And, you know, so, I guess that's next Sunday, right? The first is Sunday? Yeah. Is next Sunday? No, the first is Saturday. The first is Saturday. Okay, so the Easter egg hunt Saturday. And uh, for children 12 years up, uh, 12 years of age. Well, that means I can go. Pardon? That means, that means I can go. It's... <laughs> <laughs> what did she say? I just kind of said 12 years and up, right, didn't I? Yeah. I did. Well, it's 12 years, I assume, and under. <laughs> so, Helen, go on anyways. Make them stop you. Dare them. Uh, let's see what we have here today. Sunday school following morning worship. Election of a pastor after service this morning. Okay. District meeting is Tuesday, April 11th, and prayer list this morning. I put Ben Johnson on there. Uh, Rob just told me uh, Ben Johnson this morning. I guess he's uh, bleeding, Ooh. and so uh, spitting up blood. Yeah. So okay. we need to get that taken care of. And uh, Kristen, Re Kristen Lee Bradley is on our prayer list. That is Linda Morrow's daughter and uh, a Gaber, okay, connected with Gabers. And she had surgery this week and has some complications, and so they're asking for prayer for her. And, uh, and then we have our usual ones in Levittown Church. David Dunlop's their pastor. Arno Arnaldo Dubon is the president of Guatemala Conference. And uh, Betty Warmoth. I talked to Betty yesterday, and um, she's, she's okay. She's, you know, getting along for the shape that she's in. Um, but uh, her daughter was down there this week. And she has, you know, a variety of visiting nurses, and uh, they're keeping track of her and helping her. So keep Betty Warmoth in prayer. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, Keith. Yeah, my friend Chris Hadley, they were supposed to amputate. I told him a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. they had, thank God they ended up saving his foot. Mm -hmm. But now they found skin cancer on his face. 
So he has to get that removed, hopefully this week. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that, even with earmuffs. <laughs> he has skin cancer on his face, my friend. Who's your father? No, Chris Hadley, my friend. Chris your friend? Hadley. Yeah. And they saved his hand <coughs> Pardon? They saved his hand. His leg. His leg. His leg. His leg. His foot. His foot. His foot. Is that true? Oh. Yeah. Okay. He said it, but you didn't hear him. No, I know. That's why I'm like, uh, <laughs> even with the earmuffs. Anybody else? We'll get that, that one squared away. Uh, Jimmy S. Alami, he's having his call letter out Tuesday. Wow. Hopefully the easier way. Okay. Anybody else? Carol? Uh, Mark uh, Broach, we talked about he had the fall from the ladder and yeah. he has extensive brain injury and back and forth. He's, I, he was in Bethlehem rehab, but they were talking about trying to do some surgery here in CMC, but it's serious yep. and uncertain. Yeah. Get it back together so they're thinking they're all Wow. Just Okay. Anybody else? All right. Great to have everybody here today. <coughs> Let's turn on our handles to three forty. Standing as we say.
bulletin, turn to the inside right hand side page. You have a new responsive reading or antiphonal reading. And so the men will read the first lines, women will read the italicized. This is actually from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil doers assail me to devour my flesh, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war rise up against me. Yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, that I will seek that after. To live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. For he will hide me in his shelter in their day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Thank you, may be seated. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it and for the privilege of being a part of your kingdom. Courtesy of Jesus Christ, whose great love and his faithfulness to you took him all the way to the cross that he might suffer on our behalf, that we might not only be forgiven, but justified and become legal, as it were, participants in the kingdom of God. Our Heavenly Father, your love is great. And we are so grateful that you have revealed that to us from on high. Would you please continue to speak to us about these things? Fill our hearts with a deep understanding of who you are and who we are. And when we have that relationship in heart and mind, we worship you and we honor you and praise you justly so. Father, we're so thankful that you hear and answer all our prayers. And Lord, we have friends and family on our prayer list here today that are in great need of your help. Some of these ones have uh, conditions that are Sadly, in some places, they're terminal. In some cases, these situations can be reversed and corrected with surgery or medication or with time. And in some cases, some of these things are going to just have to be coped with and they're going to be a part of life. And we're going to need endurance and patience. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you put your healing hand upon each and every one and bring exactly what is needed. Our humble prayer is that you'd out and out heal our friends and family and that you'd restore these folk to health. Uh, but we understand, Father, that you have a far greater perspective than we do. And your purposes and your will is perfect. That one day we'll stand before you and we won't wonder anymore why you didn't respond in a certain way or why a certain episode or cup of suffering couldn't be taken away, we'll realize that you always do the right thing. And Jesus Christ, his resurrection, is evidence of all that. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for our friends down in Levittown. We pray for Dave Dunlop and the ministry they have down there. We ask that folk might find you and walk together with you in that Levittown church. We pray for our friend Arnaldo down in Guatemala. We ask you to continue to bring light and life to the people of those communities, that they might know and love you. And we're so grateful to have had a part in the work of primitive Methodism down in Guatemala. Uh, and I believe there's over 10,000 primitive Methodists in Guatemala. There's, for every primitive Methodist in the United States of America, there's now about uh, four, um, five in Guatemala. And so, Father, we are so grateful that we have been a part of spreading the gospel all over the globe. We pray today for Betty Warmoth. We ask you to watch over her and take care of her every day. We're grateful that she was able to have a little visit from her da uh, daughter this week. Uh, but, Father, we continue to pray that you'd watch over her every single day and that you'd give her comfort and peace and that you'd help her with the situa her physical situation. 
We're thankful for those that you raise up to bring such help. And again, Father, we could pray all day long. Just this morning we're hearing about tremendous catastrophes uh, down in the south, whole towns, whole villages gone. And we hear wars and rumors of wars and the things of this world are terrible. And so, Father, we ask you to come soon. And we ask you to give us faith and patience as we walk through this world and trust you. We ask for guidance, wisdom, and direction for our leadership. We ask you for grace for those who are actively involved in rescue. We ask you to hear and answer all our prayers as we raise our voices together and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. And we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of forever. Amen. And now if our choir would come forward, we'll have special music for the choir. Chapter 8. 
get them all in. Yep, me too. Directions for entering the promised land. In short, uh, for our purposes, how do you live a successful life down here in this world? We're on our way to the promised land, and yet, I guess I would most characterize, it's really interesting, we're really, we're going through a lot of things all the time. We are journeying through the wilderness in our lives, okay? But at the same time, we are occupying territory in the promised land, and at the same time, we're headed to a promised land. And so it's this, theologians always used to say it's uh, already but not yet. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day and blessings of us and the privilege of being together here this morning. And thank you for bringing us together here as a church. Our Heavenly Father, would you please pour out your Holy Spirit upon us here this morning? Because this is what makes it worth coming to this house every single Sunday. It's great to see these faces, to see people come walking up the sidewalk or uh, chit-chatting in the pews, and that's all wonderful, and it's really therapeutic. But what really makes this special is that the Spirit of God descends on us in a way that's very, very unique. You're with us all day, every day, every hour of every day. Your Spirit dwells in us. The very presence of God is in our heart. But when we gather in assembly with your, your people, other people who have the same experience, who have the same faith, same love, who are walking in the same journey, uh, there's strength and encouragement and vision and wisdom and a great purpose and encouragement. So Father, thank you for all these things. Please pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. We might sense your presence in a powerful and a special way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First verse of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8. This entire commandment, okay, that I command you today, we started out chapters 1 through 4 of the book of Deuteronomy is sort of a rehearsal of what's taken place. Uh, God has come to the nation of Israel. They were slaves, okay? They were slaves down in Egypt. Their life had become harsh, bitter, and brutal, oppressive. They were killing their male children, okay? Uh, they were saying, look, we need to pare down the size of your community. We need to see that you're not a political threat to us. We're going to take your male children and we're going to execute them, okay? And that's what it had come to. They increased the harshness of their labor so that they didn't have time for public assembly. They didn't have time to get together to talk with each other. They were so worn out at the end of the day from making bricks and not just making it, but now having to supply the, uh, the uh, items that are needed to make bricks. They're so worn out by the end of the day, they had not a chance to gather together and talk about life and where they would like to be and what they would like life to be like. And so it was just a terrible drudge. They cried out to God. And the Bible says that God heard their prayers. Okay? They weren't in the temple in Jerusalem. They weren't in a tabernacle. None of these things have even come into place yet. They weren't crying out to God from the Holy Land. They weren't kneeling at an altar of prayer. They were in a faraway nation where they didn't belong, where they had been taken as slaves. Yeah. And from that place, God heard them. What a powerful thing. How about Jonah? Jonah found out that God wanted him to bring a message of redemption and uh, forgiveness and repentance to Nineveh. He hated the Ninevites. He despised them. They were a horrible bunch of Syrians from the north our enemies for generations. Their people have been killing our people. They've been taking our crops. He despised them. He didn't want to go up there at all. And so what did he do? He says, you know what? I gotta get as far away from God as I can. And so he went down to the shore, got on a ship, 
sailing for what we think is like Spain or the Strait of Gibraltar, the farthest end of the earth he could imagine. And you know the story by the storm came up and they eventually threw Jonah overboard. And so Jonah goes down into the depths of the sea, swallowed by a great fish, right? But it says from the belly of that great fish, just think, he's as far away from his home as he can be, the land of God. He's as underwater as you can get. And he's in the belly of the fish. Now you can't get farther away from God from than, than, than that, physically speaking. But from that situation, he cried out to God. And God heard him. And responded to his prayer. And after he burped up, up on shore, he eventually goes up to Nineveh, preaches what? Repentance. And the people listen to the reluctant prophet, and they repent. Unlike the people of his own country, who he loves so deeply, they don't listen to him. But the people up in Syria, they do. And God spares them. And we find the reluctant prophet sitting under that gourd, groaning and moaning, saying to God, I, this is why I never wanted to go up there. God, I knew you were going to be merciful to them. And that's the last thing in the world I wanted to happen. I know how you are, Lord. And I know you'd forgive those people. And the prophet couldn't forgive them. But God could. The nation of Israel cried out to God from slavery. And he led them up with mighty signs and mighty wonders culminating in the parting of the Red Sea. And then they journeyed through the wilderness. Could have been in the promised land in three years. Or excuse me, three days. But instead it took 40 years. Now they stand at the brink, ready to enter the land. Moses can't go in. Their fathers, they died in the wilderness as they wandered. New generation about to enter in. Moses, the leader of the old generation. Moses, you're not going in. All right? Not for you. You've led them through the wilderness. You led them from slavery. But this isn't for you. This is for Joshua. And I'm going to come to Joshua just like I came to you. And I'm going to come to these people of Israel just like I came to them. And I'm going to show them that this is my man. I'm with him just like I was with you. All your hopes aren't pinned on some man. All your hopes aren't pinned on one situation. All your hopes aren't pinned on one circumstance. Your hopes are pinned on the God who transcends all of that. You're going to enter the promised land. When you do, Moses went up on the mountain and got the commandments. And they are articulated in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, the great commandment is deeply, deeply articulated that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. There's only one God. There's no other place for worship. There's no other place of redemption. There's no other place of help. Nothing in this world can save you. You can't, you, we can rearrange the furniture of this world. It's like rearranging what? The seats on the Titanic, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we think, gee, if we had some more money, we'd be all right. Gee, if we had more property, we'd be all right. Gee, if we had more freedom, we'd be all right. Gee, if we had, gee, if we had a different government. You name it. But the solution is never going to be found in this world. It's going to be found right here. And it's God changing us. And when we're changed inside and then become adaptable to whatever, you'll be ready to go home again. Israel, you're about to enter the promised land. You're a chosen people. I chose you out of all the people of the world. Could have chosen anybody. But I came to Abraham a long time ago. And when I came to Abraham and chose him, I swore on oath that I would bring him and his seed into the promised land. And when I swore that oath to Abraham, I knew that his seed would be rebellious, difficult, stubborn, hard-hearted. In fact, we've seen the verses. 
You people have been stubborn and hard-hearted since the day I called you. God knew it before he even started. But he called them as his own. And he even looked at them and he said, you're my treasured possession. I hope you take heart in that. To me, that's one of the greatest things in the Bible, that we look in the Bible and we don't see a, a gallery of saints who have halos, who always do the right thing, who are Johnny on the spot, as faithful as can be. We see people who are really just like us. And they're making mistakes and they're making missteps and they're slugging their way through life and they seem like sometimes they're a pinball on a pinball machine. But God doesn't give up on them. He takes people like Peter who say, Lord, I've been with you for three years. You can trust me. You're the one. My name used to be Simon. Now, you're the one who called me Rock. <coughs> you're the one who said that the gates of the kingdom of heaven would be built on me. Peter would say, excuse me, Peter would say. And then it would come time, the push would come to shove, and he'd be standing around the fire, denying Christ, cursing his name, saying, I don't know him, I never have. How about the verses in the Bible that say, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. Peter, you just lost, didn't you? You denied Jesus before men, now you're gonna be denied before the Father? Thanks to the grace of God, the Apostle Peter has a place in heaven. Thanks to the mercy of God and what Christ has done, there's forgiveness and grace, no matter how badly we fall, no matter how badly we stumble. I hope you take heart in that, because that's where our hopes are pinned, not on our holiness, not on our righteousness, our hopes are pinned on Jesus Christ and his mercy and love. And boy, that's a winner. So I tell you this, with all that said, this entire commandment that I command you today, I want you to diligently observe so that you may live and increase. You'll thrive if you obey the will of God because you'll be in accord with the nature of that God created the world to have. I'll make no mistake about it, there's a curse in this world. And it's become a place of thorns and a place of thistles. And it's become a place where childbirth, which should be the greatest thing that happens on earth, is painful and difficult and really, uh, geez, up to like 1900, one out of four children, it's at least one out of four children died in childbirth. And it's something like one out of five mothers died in childbirth. That's the curse that's upon this earth, okay? So God has given us commandments and ordinances and said, look, it's a dangerous land. If you want to navigate it, if you want to negotiate it, listen to me. Pay attention to what I tell you. I'll give you the guidance that you need. The nation of Israel, I let them by fire at night. Okay, no darkness can hold God from giving guidance or wisdom. It was fire by night, and it was a pillar of cloud by day. So what do we do? Go in and occupy the land, the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Look what he says in chapter two, verse six. Uh, excuse me, uh, verses two through six. Remember the long way the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. You see what it says here, why God did that? It says, in order to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you keep his commandments. He humbled you by letting you hunger, then by feeding you with manna, which was neither, uh, neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted. And he did this in order to make you understand that you don't live by bread alone, you live by the words that proceed from the mouth of the living God. The clothes on your back didn't wear out. Your feet didn't swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a parent disciplines a child, so the Lord your God disciplines you. So keep these commandments of the Lord your God. While walking in his ways, and fearing him. 
He says, remember these things. What a great gift memory is. That's one of the greatest things I think we have in this world is memory. It can be a curse if we dwell on the things of the past that were terrible. And unfortunately, some people have that. I don't know if it's a thorn in the flesh, if it's a self-inflicted wound, if it's something that you should be able to correct, but it's your burden that you can't. But you know people, I know some people, who to sit and talk to them is going to be a very short time till they begin to rehearse to you all the hurts they've had in life and all the disappointments and how people treated them so poorly. And then it's on to how difficult life has become because, and they start describing all the issues that you have in your life, right? And they're the, they're the same things you are experiencing, but to them they seem overwhelming and they seem devastating. I, I wish to think, I wish to think that we can control our attitude. I wish to think that we can control the way we handle our memory. I'm not sure if we can, because the people that get locked into that, they don't seem to come out. And age only makes it worse. And all the encouragement in the world, and they'll quote to you, they can quote to you scriptures about not worrying. They'll say the Lord's Prayer along with everybody else where we say all the time, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But some people can't get out of that hole. Thank God that the God who could forgive Peter, the God who could forgive the doubting Thomas, the God who could call Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who could promise the nation of Israel, I'll never leave you to forsake you. I've told you, there's no other God. But by the time it comes down to where I end up having to discipline you and scatter you, you're going to have filled my temple with shrines to other gods. You're going to be worshiping the gods of foreign countries who have no power at all, only negative power. You're going to fill my temple with that, and I'm going to have to discipline you. That's some people's lot in life. I don't know, I look around, I don't see anybody who has that ter terribly negative thing. We all have a certain bent to it. It's always popular fair to get together and talk about what's gone wrong, what's bad, what's the bad news today. But if you can, don't let it control you. Don't let it take over your life. A big solution is don't watch the news anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not kidding. We, I, I used to watch the news. We, we watched three, four hours a night. And after a little while, you know, you're ready for the world to end next morning. Terrible things are about to happen. I just saw it all last night. They talked about it all night. And then the morning comes, and the terrible things are about to befall us. And they don't happen. But they're going to happen tomorrow. So be stay tuned. And you watch again that night. And again, the snowball is even bigger. And it's going to be worse. And tomorrow morning comes when the snowball, Damocles sword, falls on you. Remember when it fell on you? It hasn't fallen on us, has it? It hasn't fallen on us, has it? When I was a kid, waiting for the Russians with their nuclear weapons, and they were going to trip that switch. And then the President of the United States, whoever it happened to be back in the day, remember he had a black suitcase. And inside the suitcase was a red button. Red a lot like, you know, the bat phone. You know how that was red? Well, he had a red button in there. And all we had to do was Russia to launch that first weapon. And he had a secret code that him and his hand, I, I, I thought only he knew it. I, probably his handlers knew it. He didn't know what it was. But a secret code 
And he was going to open that suitcase and press the button, and then the nuclear weapons from our country are going to go there. And it was mutual destruction. The whole world destroyed, right? And me up there in Manlius, New York, watching everything disappear on the horizon before me. Remember when that happened? Oh yeah, it never happened. And I laid in bed last night, looking up at the ceiling, wishing I could be asleep, but I couldn't. Because all of a sudden I'm thinking I'm 63, wow, you know, I could conceivably retire in two years. I could conceivably retire. I, I never thought about this in my life, but last night it was on. <laughs> And I'm thinking, well, I'll keep preaching. Maybe what can happen is I'll take my retirement, you know, from conference and retire. And maybe I could still preach here. And uh, you probably won't be able to pay me a salary because that would be making too much. So I'll be living on our retirement, right? You liking this or not? That's the way you're looking. I'm thinking, we'll be living here. We'll get whatever minimum you could pay and still be retired. We'll have that retirement money. Oh, no. Last I knew, I think it was 125000 in the retirement. We don't have a house. We don't have anything. We just have that, right? But I think it's down to 100000 because the economy backed up in the last, what, two or three years? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so, oh, no. What happens if this keeps happening? Maybe I should retire now and get what's there before it's gone. Because if I don't grab it now, it's going to be gone. And our conference is going to fall apart. And everybody's going to want their money all at once. And there's going to be nothing left for me. What in the world will I do? I looked at the ceiling and wondered about that tragedy. And then I remembered, then I remembered that all my life catastrophe has been on the horizon and it's never fallen on me. Somehow, there's a God who could sustain us. In spite, you know when the Apostle Paul, he wrote and he says, look, you pray for your rulers, okay? Pray for the heads of state where you are. That means if you're a Trump hater, you gotta pray for Donald Trump if and when he's president, right? Right? Right. right. <laughs> that means if Joe Biden's president, whether you like him and his policies or not, you gotta pray for him, right? Right. Right. And so, <laughs> what would happen if we lived in ancient Rome, like Paul did when he wrote those words, and Nero was the emperor? And the Emperor Nero decided that, you know what, this Christian thing is an issue. Uh, these people, they don't want to participate in our society. They don't believe in our gods. They called the early Christians atheists. Because the God you believe in, he's not God. It's the gods of Rome. They're God. They're the ones that sustain us. And the early church writings are fascinating because they're debating. St. Augustine is one of the primary ones. Excuse me. And the Ro Romans were saying Christians are the reason that the Roman Empire is collapsing because they will not worship the gods we need to worship. And by their unfaithfulness, they're ruining our world. And the Christians are saying, they're trying to reason this out and show you that this is a long succession that's been happening long before Christianity came. And there's various arguments, and they go back and forth. But that's what was going on in ancient Rome. And so sometimes somebody like Nero came along and said, you know what, for a night's entertainment, let's get some of those Christians. We'll make an example of them. We'll strap them to poles in my garden. And I'll take a chariot ride through the garden. And we'll set them on fire. We'll set their bodies on fire. We'll douse them with kerosene, and they'll become human torches. And then people will see and say, hey, you know what? I'm not so sure I want to be a Christian anymore. Uh, I don't want to become a, 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 a bug lamp in Pharaoh's garden. And on it goes. And you know what happened? When Pharaoh 
or excuse me, when, yeah, when Pharaoh decided to squash the Israelite people, when Nero decided to squash the Christian people, when Nazi Germany decided that we need to destroy Judaism and put an end to them, and you know what happened? They continue to thrive. In fact, they say the blood of the martyrs is the seeds of the church. Because God is more powerful than the things we fear. God is more powerful than the things that keep us up at night. God has control of all these things. You know what would happen if my little... Wait till you hear what I, I concluded last night. I thought, well, what could they take away from me? Right? What if the government comes and zeroes out all our bank accounts and decides we're plunging everybody into communism? And nobody has any money. Only the government can give it to you. And if we give it to you, then that's all you get. But you better play ball by our rules or you don't get it. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, what would happen if that did happen? I still have my books. And I probably still have a bed to sleep in. And I'll bet any money I'd be eating the same food that I've been eating my whole life. And I bet the air around me will still be here and I'll still be breathing it. You know what? I have a feeling not much would change. Because God is still in control of the heavens and the earth. And he is the one we should fear. And not the news. And not the, the sky is falling crowd whoever they may be, and I mean whoever they may be. And likewise, the things of this world. God has full control over them, and he will take care of his people. Remember, he always has. I remember standing in the foundry as a young man, having watched everything that was given to me, all the opportunities that were given to me, just really spiraled down a drain of my own doing and wondering what in the world have I done and how is this ever going to change how could I ever get out of mom and dad's house what in the world? I have nothing going for me I remember being in the primitive Methodist church in Johnson City New York and I remember an old man named Floyd Harvey coming in one day he used to live right across the street here back in the day and Floyd came in and he was what you would call an old codger. And he kind of puttered around and he came in and he says, uh, what are you doing with your life? I've been saved for a little while. And I'm like, well, I don't know, I'm just lick living it. <laughs> and he says, well, you know, I, I don't know if I was going out with Beth yet. I might have been, but he says, you, you're not, you, you're going to want to get married, and you can't just be married and be janitor of this church. Okay? You're going to need more than that. So, maybe get a job at IBM. Or maybe go across the street and get a job at the fire station. And I'm listening to this Floyd Harvey, who I love, by the way, and I'm thinking, he just wants the janitor job that I have. He just wants to go somewhere else so he can take this. <laughs> And um, God started to speak to me. And people had been telling me, you know what, you, you should go back to school. You know what, you should go be a preacher. Because I would go around, to, Beth's family had a singing group. And they would go to prisons. They'd go to churches throughout northeastern Pennsylvania and uh, southern tier of New York. And they would sing in different church things. And, they started taking me around and I'd give them my testimony how I got saved. And people come and say, hey, you know what? You should be a preacher. <sighs> That's not for me. Yeah, I gotta go to school to be a preacher. And I've bombed out on that about three times. No, that's not for me. But God started to speak to me because I remember this. I remember going to the library of the Johnson City Church, which was, slightly more used than our library here, but not a whole lot more. I, I used it, and there was probably two or three other ladies who used it. But I went to that library, and there was a catalog in there from a Greenville College in Greenville, Indiana. It's a free Methodist college. And I looked at the back of that, and looked in that catalog, and I saw courses like 
studying about the Bible, and I thought, this is great. But then I thought, oh, once they see my record, they're not going to let me into their school. And I looked at the back of the catalog, in the back of it, and it said, you know what? It said, if you've been out of school for, I think it said a year, and you had a bad record, but there's reason to believe you do differently, we will take you in maybe on probation. And if you make the marks, then we'll take you off probation, but we'll give you a chance. And when I read those words, I thought, oh my God in heaven, these people know about being born again. These people know that God can change people. And that's why they're offering that. They're talking about me right here. Two days later, down in the basement of the church, just like this one, with a mop in my hand, mop in the floor, and God came and said, you're going back to school. I think it said in the order, it was, you're going to be a preacher and you're going back to school. And all of a sudden I had clarity. And for the first time in my life, I had something that was a really worth going for it, really had direction in my life. I stood in the foundry wondering, where in the world are you gonna go from here? You can't even get out of your parents' house. I stood in that Johnson City PM Church with a mop in my hand and Floyd Harvey saying, you gotta get something going. And I had nothing going. But I remember how God came into my life. And little by little, things fell into place. The next thing I knew was going down to United Wesleyan College in Allentown. The first grade I got down there was a D. I told, I've told you this probably a few times. I don't know if anybody remembers it. But I got a D and I thought, oh, geez. Maybe I can't do this work after all. Even though I'm saved, I can't do this. But Dad, I remembered. My father telling me was in grade school, why don't you go and talk to your teacher and find out what you got to do to catch up? Because I always had a report card that said, you need to catch up. And I thought, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. I'm not going to my teacher and saying, what do I need to do to catch up? I would never do such a thing. But I remembered. And I went to Dr. Balacondra Theodore was from India, and I told him, Dr. Th he thought I was there to argue about grade. He thought I was there to say, I could have gotten a B on this paper and you gave me a D. This isn't fair, this isn't right. How can you do such things to poor people like me? But instead I went and I said, Dr. Theodore, I don't know what I did wrong. I don't know how to do right. Would you please show me, would you please help me to understand how to write the paper you want me to write. And he sat down with me, little Indian man about this big, remember Dr. Theodore? Broken English, and he helped me. And I started getting really good grades. I remember all that. Remember in your life, when you had nothing going, Remember when the roof fell in and you found out, oh no, there's a situation in my life that this is really a problem. Wait till mom and dad find out. And then mom and dad find out and then it's like, okay, if you feel a little bit better about it, but you're still, what am I going to do now? And you know what? Hasn't God come into your life every single time and brought deliverance? Or at least brought you the sustenance you needed to persevere in the middle of the storm? Some storms, they last longer than others. But the God, remember, this is why he does it. I brought you through that wilderness. I am intentionally humbling you, testing you to know what's in your heart. Because I have great things for you. You can't imagine what's on the horizon. You don't know tomorrow. Eternity's in our hearts. We have a sense of eternity. We don't know it. We don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring. So I need you to be faithful. And I need you to, when you get knocked down, to keep getting back up. And I need you to think about what it might take to possibly improve. And I need you to 
I love it at the bottom of it. Just get to the bottom. He says, therefore keep the commandments, this is in our paragraph, of the Lord your God. What does he say? By walking, walking in his way. The Jewish people have a halakha. Halakha, not Hanukkah, ha with an L. And it's an important Jewish ritual, and it is the walk. Halak. We walk with him. We don't run with him. We walk. It's a step-by-step -step journey. It's one step at a time. And we do it by fearing him. By not being afraid of the world, but by assessing the world and then remembering that our God is greater than anything in this world. He always has been. He always will be. He is the one to trust. Let's pray. So Father, thank you for your holy word. Because again, Father, you know, we're just ordinary people down here in this world. And sometimes we go through storms, and while they're raging, I don't know how we're ever going to get out. I don't know how we're ever going to make it. And then sometimes the storm's raging stops, and we're left with a great ruin. And we look around us and we don't know how we're ever going to get this back together. Our Father, would you speak to us? That you have made the world this way. Because if the world wasn't this way, we would abandon you and never come back. No matter what we think, we're Peter. Lord, you know me. Well, you can show, I'll show up. Yeah. And then before the night's over, he denied her, denied the Lord three times, even at the threat, the intimidating factor of a young girl at the fire, asking a simple question and setting Peter off into oath and curse and deny the name of Christ. <coughs> Our Father, would you speak to us about these things? We're not nearly as strong as we think. We need what you give us. You give us what we can handle, and there's a purpose to it. And our only hope is to trust you. We could stare at the ceiling and wonder when the bomb is going to go off. And not going to change. If it does go off, it doesn't change anything anyways. Or we could stare at the ceiling and say, Lord, I guess this is out of my control. I guess this is out of my hands like it's always been. And so I'm going to remember how you've always been with me. And I'm going to walk with you. Speak to us about these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's turn in our hymnals to 87. Now let's all stand as we sing.
3,500 years ago. And those words are still echoing in our ears today. We remember them. We get strength from them. Would you continue to speak to us and be our God? And we'll be grateful forever in Jesus' name.